worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who ever now will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout. You are faithful. You are faithful.
Lord, you are faithful. You agree. God is faithful. God is faithful. I've seen him do it before. And I have to remind myself sometimes. He did it before. And he's faithful. So he'll do it again. Amen. Amen. Lord, we declare your faithfulness. You are a faithful God. Let's worship him this morning. Angels gather around the throne. We're going to gather one day and sing, Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty.
there before the throne of grace majesty before my eyes I'll let him take my breath away all glory all glory and honor dominion and power What a sweet presence of Jesus there is here. Thank you, Lord, that we come together under the banner of your name. God, where we can worship, we can express our hearts to you. God, and through it, you reach down and you touch us. That our relationships our relationship with you, it grows, it moves forward, it stretches out. Thank you, God, that you love us. Thank you, Lord, that you're for us. Thank you, God, that we have this time just to play instruments and sing songs, but to come together as a body to honor you, to bring blessing, to, to express love to you. Thank you, Lord, in the awesome name of Jesus. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, worship team. You know, we never uh, we never really thank our worship team and sound and tech people. Um, most of the time they get mentioned when something messes up in the service. But I, I, we are so blessed to have such a, a great committed team. So thank you guys in the back and up here. Awesome group. Thank you. All right, let me just share a few announcements with you, if we would, or kids, if you would stand and line up here at the door for children's ministry. I hope you guys had a great week last week. Did you guys enjoy that last week? Yes, I think so. Okay. And um, if you have not joined our text group, please do so. Uh, just text the word welcome to this number. And um, we'll just keep in contact with you through the week and let you know special events and different things that we're doing. Also, just want to remind you that our Wednesday night classes have started, and um, they start at 6.30. We are done right by 7.30, so that if you have kids, you can get them here and get them home at a decent time. We have God Squad for the kids down in the children's room. We are teaching here in the sanctuary on the armor of God. Um, that's open for anybody. And then we're asking the other two classes. We've got a men's class and a women's class. 
We're asking you to come through the side door back here in the, on the, the large parking lot, the single glass door. The ladies will go downstairs to the women's class, Fierce Women of God. There's a video series that they're, and a teaching that they're doing. The men will go up the steps. You'll see signs uh, to, to my office for uh, a men's meeting on, the, um, on walking in the spirit. So hope that you'll come out on Wednesday nights. We're having a great time. Uh, just again, want to remind you that we're collecting supplies for a school in Jamaica. I'll, I'll show you a quick picture here in a minute of that. And also just want to remind you, we are planning um, our Jamaica trip for January, Lord willing, with, uh, you know, coronavirus could, could change that, but our, our plans are to still go. And so if you're interested, I have, I have information from the information meeting. If you want to go see me at the end of the service, I got them here on the front row. Um, here were just some pictures from uh, years past. Uh, that's the one on the left is uh, our, our students doing drama at, at uh, Teen Challenge in Ocho Rios. And then down below is, is a house that we built in a day for, uh, for uh, Jamaicans who had been displaced, their house burnt. And so we, our, our team built a house in a day. And then at top is, uh, is Bev, who uh, you, most of you have heard the story of her life and her transformation. And uh, here's some students doing drama and uh, just loving young kids. I, I believe that the, the picture on the bottom right, the two on the right, were, were taken at, at Pineapple School. And this is Pineapple Place Basic School. It's a, it's a preschool that we're collecting the uh, supplies for, for a uh, preschool ages three to, to six. And so uh, then we'll pack them up and take them to uh, Jamaica the next time we go. Also just want to remind you that uh, fire in the field, uh, a tent um, outreach for the uh, for the whole county will be taking place October the 10th to the 14th on Sunday evening, uh, starting that Sunday night, going through Thursday night. And if you would like to be a part of that, in the bulletin is is my dad. Dale is his email address. If you would like to serve as an usher or an altar worker, there is just a little bit of training, but uh, this is uh, this is going to be for an outreach for our entire entire county. So we, uh, you know, we're, we're going to really designate some nights that that we're there as a church and supporting that effort and and seeing people come to the kingdom. Dad, did you have anything you want to add to that? I think we're just two Sundays away. I got it. Did it all right. All right. If he's happy, I'm happy for sure. All right. So just email him. His email is in there, and then he will put you in contact. So if you want to serve as an usher, maybe you can do all uh, each night, or maybe it's just. Uh, one night or an altar worker, please see him. Uh, we'd love to have some altar workers from our church because I think uh, the, the instructions that they're going to teach is something that we can really apply right here. So uh, hopefully some of you can do that. Just email him. And then the last thing I want to share with you is on the 24th of October, we're going to do our last drive-in service of the year. Pray for good, warm weather. Wasn't last Sunday a beautiful, beautiful day and uh, just gorgeous. If anything, it got just a little warm. Um, so that's going to be the 24th of October uh, at 10 a.m. over on the field. It'll just be the one service outside. We'll have something special again for the kids. And um, uh, we're, gonna, we're calling it Hoodie Sunday. So you can wear your favorite hoodie to stay warm. And as long as the, the weather holds out, we'll, we'll be there on the 24th. All right, well, it's the 25th of October. You know what that means? Three months before Christmas just to kind of get you in the mood, okay? So uh, I've been sharing about the anchors of our soul, and we've been talking from Acts 27, where the Apostle Paul was, uh, was on a ship from, from Jerusalem, now going to Rome to stand before Caesar. And uh, they've been blowing, the wind has been blowing, they're in the middle of a nor'easter on this large flat bottom boat. They've been blowing in the wind for 14 days. 14 days. And an angel appears to him and says, Paul, it's gonna, you're going to be okay. Nobody's going nobody's gonna to perish, but you need to prepare yourself for it. And so Paul stands up and he tells the captain they really didn't want to listen and, and they just kept, kept on going. And it says, finally, they took anchors and they began, to, they began to drop four anchors. So over the last four weeks, I've shared about the four anchors. The first anchor that we've got to drop in our lives is the anchor of faith. Faith is just... Simply, it's a trust walk with Jesus. It's a trust walk with Jesus. And so faith was the first week. And then we talked about peace. And, and, and these four anchors are really just kind of essentials of our walk with God. 
It's things that we really need in our lives and that, that we need to be engaged in. So faith is the first one. The second is peace. When I say peace, I'm not referring to the things around you, but the peace of God in you. To me, peace is one of the greatest indicators of God's presence being present. So we have faith and we have peace. If you don't have, uh, if you just have faith, but you never have peace, your faith really never gets activated. The last week we talked about hope, and, and hope is all central to the person of Jesus at the cross. And we use this scripture from last week, Romans 15, 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may, uh, so, so that you may overflow with hope in the power of the Holy Spirit. Hope. It's important to have hope in life. It's important to have hope. So the fourth anchor today is the anchor of surrender. When we drop the fourth anchor of surrender, it fully allows us to trust God because we have released everything to Him. You know, the word surrender is not always a necessarily a positive word. Uh, sometimes some people may look at surrender as a as a, a thing of weakness. If if you were anything like me growing up, there was always a Western movie playing in our home. In fact, a lot of times today you walk in in the afternoon, there may be an old Western movie playing. But one of the things you that you found out very quickly is that someone with authority, usually with a gun, pointed at somebody else, and he would say, come up with your hands out, come out with your hands up. And so the, the lifting of the hands is a universal sign of surrender. But as we, we talk about surrendering, when I, when I think of scriptures that really apply, I want to just kind of look at a few this morning. The, the first one is from Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And in Luke chapter 9, in this passage of Scripture, uh, Jesus is, has been talking to the disciples. And it's really, it's really a, a passage, a chapter of action. And in the beginning part of chapter 9, Jesus sends out 12. And, he's, and when he sends them out, he says, you know, don't take a lot of stuff with you. I'm going to meet your needs. I'll take care of you. And, and then he suddenly, you know, I think as part of that, he shows them that he's going to take care of them because then he feeds 5,000 people. And after he does that, then he, then he begins to address some things, and he begins to really corner some of his disciples. In particular, he, he's cornering Peter, who would become one of the great apostles. But he says to Peter, Peter, who do the crowds say that I am? When I'm teaching and there's a crowd of, of people, who do, what do they think about me? And Peter responded, he said, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah or one of the other prophets that's uh, from long ago that's come back to life. And then Jesus makes it really personal. He said, Peter, how about you? Who do you think that I am? And Peter responded, this version here is a little different, uh, but one, one of the other uh, Gospels, Peter responds and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and then all of a sudden, Jesus, Jesus transitions in his teaching. And, and he goes from hearing Peter making this, this great proclamation that, that Jesus is the Son of the living God. And then Jesus starts talking about how he is going to be rejected by men and that he's going to be brutally beat and he's going to carry his own cross and he's going to be crucified. And, and suddenly he goes from a, from a very special, intimate moment, and, and, like, and Jesus kind of turns the whole, the whole scene. And suddenly, you know, the disciples were excited about following him and, and, and doing great things, but then suddenly when he says, you know, that I'm, I'm going to die, I'm going to die because of what I'm doing for you and for mankind. And then in, in the midst of this, Jesus looks at the disciples and he says to them, if anyone would come after me, wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Three parts of that 
Deny yourself. Deny yourself. When we deny ourselves and take up our cross, first of all, denying ourselves means simply putting other people ahead of us. We live in a society where it's all about us. It's about what makes us feel good. And and, and we are we are kind of consumed with with uh, wanting everything our way. I, I was watching a movie while we were on vacation, and it 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 wasn't um, it wasn't a spiritual movie by any means. It was kind of a war movie, and and um, I was watching this movie, and and in the movie, two of the main actors are talking. And it was in the middle of a war. And, and one, of the, one of the actors says to the, the American, he said, you know your problem in America, he said, you have lives so good, everything is so good, that you can't appreciate an afterlife. And I thought, what a powerful, powerful statement in a war movie. And it's so true. We want, we want our lives to be so comfortable that it doesn't get much better than this. We say that expression sometimes. It doesn't get much better than this. And I think because of that, we get so fixated on this life that sometimes we fail to forget what heaven's going to be like. So Jesus says, deny yourself. And then he says something that he didn't need to give a a theological explanation because the disciples knew exactly what he meant. When he said, take up your cross daily and follow me, they understood that the cross was was never about uh, self-promotion or self-affirmation, but but the cross was a cruel instrument of death. It was an instrument of murder. And if you were destined or charged to be crucified, you would have to carry your cross from the place where you were to the place that you were going to be crucified. Thus, we know that on Good Friday that Jesus carried his own cross. And so Jesus says this to the disciples. If you want to be my disciple, deny yourself, put other people in front of you, take up your cross daily if you really want to follow me. It it wasn't it wasn't this message that really in 2021 in America that we really want to hear. It was a hard message. It was a message that you may lose your life. You know, of the 12 disciples that Jesus talked to, that he told that very thing to, 11 of them died as martyrs. I mean, it's a hard word. It's not easy. In fact, the only one that didn't, if you remember Jesus sitting there at the Last Supper and John the Beloved with his head, on Jesus' shoulder, and Jesus speaks to the disciples, you know, and, and tells them they, they may lose their life on account of him. And one of them says, well, how about John? And Jesus says, what is that to you? Well, it turns out that John the Beloved was the only one that didn't die a martyr. Although they tried to stone him, they tried to boil him to death on the Isle of Patmos, but he's the only disciple that died a natural death. So if we go back to a few weeks ago when I talked about those words that Jesus said, come follow me, and they responded, I don't know that those guys fully understood where they were following him to. But Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. Surrendering to God means letting go of my plans. Now, I'm not telling you here this morning that from here on out, if you want to follow God, you're going to be crucified. Just for the record. Everybody with me? Feel a little better now? Okay. But what I am saying, this fourth anchor about surrender means letting go of our plans and letting God have his way in every aspect of our lives, allowing him to guide our steps, direct our decisions. As Christians, this means we surrender our will for his perfect will, and we'll follow him. We'll follow him, no matter what it costs no matter what we give up, because we know that in the end, what we receive from him will be so much better. I I love missionary stories. I got to tell you, it probably started as a a child. 
um, this church was uh, a huge missions giving church. And we frequently had missionaries come in from different places around the world. And I, and I, I, would, just, I would listen to, to missionary stories, and it just amazed me that, that people would leave the comfort of their home and they would go to, a, to another place in another part of the world with their family and set up home to reach people for the cause of Christ. And i got to tell you, in my life, I probably have more respect for missionaries than any other vocation because of the sacrifices they make. But yet to them, it's about being obedient to the calling. So I've always loved missionary stories. And one of my favorite ones I, I had never heard of and, and just ran across this um, a few years ago when I was, I was reading. Uh, and this is about A.W. Milne. He was, a, he was born and raised in Scotland, and he was thinking about being an attorney. And as a young man, he had, he had a radical conversion and felt like that God was calling him to missions. And so he began to prepare, and he got connected with the London Missionary Society. And this is in the, the very early 1800s. And he began to pray and began to seek the Lord about where he would go and seeking counsel from the, the uh, LMS and trying to figure out where he fit in in life and where God had designed him to go. And there was this connection with this island in the South Pacific called, called the New Hebrides. The only problem with this 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 island is most of the missionaries that had ever gone there before were beheaded. The people living on the island were hit hunters. And that's what he began to feel like that God was calling him to the South Pacific, to this particular island. I don't know about you, but I'd say, Lord, I'll go anywhere but, uh, you know, New Hebrides. But it's what God called him to do. But there was something else that was unique about the calling in, in this generation with this missionary society that, that, that was a little different for A.W. Milne than it was for a lot of missionaries. And this is what happened, real simple to this. They were instructed that if you want to go to the mission field, the first thing you must do is raise enough money for a one-way ticket, one-way travel. The second thing you had to do is go out and get some wood and build your own casket. Now, that gets you excited about going to the mission field. Think about this. You've you got to buy a one-way ticket, and you go buy some wood, and you build your own casket. And in that casket, you are to put and place very neatly and pack as well as you can not just cram stuff in, but it's got to be, it, it had to be folded so you neat and, and placed it so you can get everything you need because you needed to get everything that you needed that, that w would sustain you and you had to get it into that casket. And then you would put the lid on the casket, nail it shut. And then when the time was right, you would go down to the harbor and you would get on the boat and you would pay the fare with you and your family and you would take your casket. What, what a symbolism of denying yourself. Can you imagine that? You built your own casket. You packed all your supplies in it. And then you take it on the boat with you. And, and this revolution that was happening in world missions in the early 1800s was called one-way missionaries. One-way missionaries. There wasn't a plan B. That wasn't a question. Well, what if this doesn't work? It just worked. It was God's way or no way. Can you imagine how he felt when he boarded a boat going to a country where most of the missionaries who had been there before had been beheaded? But A.W. Milne got there and, and spent about three and a half decades in the New Hebrides. And he died on the island. Had a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous impact on the island. And when he died, the natives on the island, they buried him there. 
and to put a sign on his grave. When he came, there was no light. But when he left, there was no darkness. What a statement about a man's life. I will deny myself for the cause of Christ. Because I want to bring God's light into this world. You know, there's a lot of scriptures that I, I could share with you this morning. And I just want to look at it a couple real quick. And, and, and one, is, one is simply Acts 9, the conversion of Saul, who becomes the Apostle Paul. And as he's walking, uh, the beginning part of that chapter, I'm not going to read all the chapters of these verses. I just want to kind of highlight them. But it says he was still breathing out murderous threats. You know, Paul was a theologian of his day. He was, he was very educated in the Scripture. However, although the New Testament wasn't written, he didn't know that he was part, in Acts 9, that he would be part of the rest of the New Testament. In fact, Paul ended up writing two-thirds of the New Testament. But in his journey, he felt in life that anyone who was in the way, which the way was a symbolism of saying a, a follower of Jesus, he thought that they were being... Uh, obstructionist to the Torah and the Old Testament. So therefore, he felt it was in, in, in their best interest for him to do everything that he could to exterminate them. And so he is breathing out murderous threats. Back in chapter 7, he was the one giving approval when Stephen was stoned to death. And so now here he is in Acts chapter 7, and he's, he's walking on his way to Damascus to persecute people in the church. That was his mission, and this is the crazy thing. He really felt what he was doing was of God. He really felt that what he was doing was ordained by God. That's how twisted people can be sometimes. He's walking, and as he's walking in Acts chapter 9, Scripture says this lightning flashes from heaven, and it knocks him to the ground. And, and Saul doesn't know what to do, what to say. There were these scales that kind of came over his eyes. He, he was blind. He, he couldn't see. But he responded and he said, who are you, Lord? And Jesus spoke to him and said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, who you're persecuting. You see, Jesus begins to speak now for Stephen, who has died. The, 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 the blood of Stephen had been poured out. But Jesus hadn't forgot the blood of Stephen that had been poured out that died as a martyr. Because Stephen represented Jesus. And now Jesus says, I'll stand in defense of Stephen. He's already gone on to heaven. And suddenly in this passage of Scripture, Saul comes to a point of recognizing with all of his education, of everything he knew about the Scripture, Paul, Saul, was raised and taught under some of the finest teachers of, of the land. But he didn't have a relationship with Jesus. You see, you can have a lot of knowledge of this book, but not being in relationship with Jesus. And you can have no, no knowledge of this book, but enter into a relationship with Jesus. But what's powerful is when the two line together. So somewhere through this experience of light flashing, and him falling to the ground. And the next few days, because he was led to a, to a town, and for three days he couldn't see anything. He didn't eat, he didn't drink. Somewhere in that time, there was enough revelation that Paul said to himself, I want to follow after Christ. I'm going to deny, I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to take up that cross and follow him. And a transformation happened in a man's heart. Literal scales fell from his eyes. And when they fell from his eyes, he could see in a way he had never seen before. The man became on fire for the things of God. And he literally wrote just about the rest of the New Testament from here on out. We, we go on and we look at the prodigal son. And this story is... First of all, we've we got to remember that the, the, the prodigal son, it was a parable. And Jesus is teaching to a Jewish audience. So think about this. 
He's teaching to a Jewish audience. And in this, he begins to tell the story of a son who goes wayward. He went to his father and he said, I'd like to have my inheritance. And the father gave him the inheritance that was due to him. And one version of the Bible says that he wasted his money in riotous living. In other words, he got however much money it was, and he went out and he just partied. He had fun. He sowed his wild oats. He found that there is pleasure in sin for a season, just as the Old Testament. But in the end, he came up very, very empty. In fact, Jesus, in this parable, takes the prodigal to the lowest place that a Jewish person could go. He wasn't just working with pigs, which wasn't kosher, but he was in the pig pen. You couldn't get any lower as a Jewish person. It was the vilest place you could be. <clears throat> and Jesus paints this picture. This son has blown it. He has made mistakes. He's embarrassed his family. He's embarrassed himself. And everything that made him something, all the reputation that he had, now meant nothing. He'd wasted every bit of it. And he finds himself longing for the scraps that a pig would eat. Then verse 17. If I did a sermon on my favorite scriptures, and I could pick five of them, this would be one. Verse 17 of chapter 15. It says, when he came to his senses. <clears throat> Let me just say to you, if you have a son or a daughter, a spouse, a friend, someone that you know that's not serving God, and you, you're trying to be light to them, pray this prayer. God, bring them to their spiritual senses. That's what happened right here. He came to his senses. He was at, we use the expression, at the bottom of the barrel. Remember, a Jewish guy in the pig pen. It wasn't a pretty sight. But he came to his senses. And this is what happens. He begins to speak about the intentions in his heart. Remember that word, intentions in his heart. And he said, How many of my father's hired hands have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and I'll go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. All the intentions of saying the right thing was in his heart. I heard it said years ago that, you know, we, we judge ourselves by our intentions, but we judge other people by their actions. Kind of unfair, isn't it? <clears throat> so this guy says all the right things. He's in the pig pen, but he says all the right things. His intentions are right. So in those five verses, probably another one that I may use is verse 20. Because it's one thing, we can say all the right things, but until we put, we put feet to that, it does no good. All we have done is just created good intentions. But verse 20 says, so he got up and he went to his father. He got up, he put action to his intentions and his words. And what I love about this scripture now is that but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, filled with compassion. There is something about the heart of the father that was looking, that was waiting for the son to come home. Now, I don't know if the son went out every day and looked down that long lane and waiting for that boy to walk back, hoping that one day he would come back. But he, he comes back to the, and, and, you know, you know the rest of the story that he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And, and he, begins to, he begins to express to him that he's not worthy because of, be called his son. It's like the father ignored him. He said, quick, bring the fattened ram. The son who was now dead is now alive. There's something about denying ourselves, coming to the end of ourselves, taking up our cross, following him. The, the last scripture that I just want to reference is in Luke 22. And, and you know, Jesus has told Peter, uh, that Peter, you're going to fall away. And Peter says, no, not, not me, Lord. I'll never, I'll never deny you. And Jesus said in John, it's recorded, that, that, that Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, you can't follow me. 
And Peter's probably thinking, what? What are you talking about? No, you can't follow me. You know why? Because you're going to fail. But you will in time. You'll get it right. And so as, as we look at, at chapter 22, the, the interesting thing about chapter 22 of Luke is that Judas denies Christ or betrays him. And the way that, Ju- the way that Judas dealt with his remorse is that he went out and he took his life, committed suicide. Peter denies him three times. And as Peter denies him, the Scripture says that Peter went out and he wept bitterly. There's something about the person that knows how to stop and come back and get things right with God and turn from it. Peter turned from it. He found out what surrender was all about. See, I don't think that God is so much concerned about what you have done, but it's what you do with what you've done. Can you take your past and put it behind you? Can you say, God, this is the things I've done. This is the mistakes I've made. This is the successes that I've created. Sometimes success can be as as damaging as failure. But if I take all this stuff and I can say, God, I surrender it all to you. Oswald Chambers said this, there's only one thing God wants of us, and that is unconditional surrender. I heard a story many years ago that I've shared a few times, but since you guys are hard-headed and, and forget what I say a lot of times, I'm going to tell you again. But the story is real simple. A, a guy came to Christ in relationship. Jesus knocked on the door of his heart and he said, I want everything. And the guy says, Lord, I want to serve you. I give you everything. And then Jesus made it a little more direct. He said, but there, there's a couple things that you're holding on to. And the guy said, what is it, Lord? I'll give you all. He said, you've got two houses. I want you to give me your houses. So the man thought about it, and he came back, and he said, Jesus, I've given you everything I've got, everything, except these two houses. So I'll, I'll give you one of them, keep one for myself. And Jesus says, thank you. A little while later, Jesus comes back and says, hey, you want to go? forward in me? Yes, Lord, you know I have. I've given up so much. And Jesus said, I want that last house. And the man said, Jesus, I've given you everything. Just one house. I, I just want one house, but you know what? I want to follow you. So in this house, there are nine ro- there are ten rooms. God, I'll give you nine of them. Just let me keep the one for myself. A little while later, Jesus comes back. Hey, you want to follow after me? Lord, you know, I've given you everything. The only thing I have for myself now is this one room. And Jesus says, I know. I want it. The man thought about the things that had been happening in his life spiritually. He said, God, I, I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to give you the room. But Lord, in that room... There's a closet. And the story goes on of how, but you know, there's no such thing as halfway surrendering. Oswald Chambers hit it, man. It's unconditional surrender. When I can willingly lay everything down, it's not easy to do because we're so fixated with the things of this life. Mother Teresa said this. She said, Give yourself fully to God. He will use you to accomplish great things on the condition that you believe much more in His love than your own weakness. Sometimes it's a matter of weakness because it's just always been the way that it's been, and so we don't feel like we can ever change. It's easier to buy into this concept of weakness instead of His strength. But what we have to do is 
surrender it all. If you really want to know God and to get close to Him, you've got to learn the art of surrender. When we, we talk about unconditional surrender in, in the kingdom of God, you know, we, we oftentimes make excuses for things. I, I, I took this picture several years ago. It comes from uh, Litch, Litchfield Park, Arizona. I don't know exactly where that is, but I would not want to work for a dot like Del Dot and to have been part of this. But, you know, sometimes when it comes to this issue of surrender, we, we try to just forget it and say, let somebody else do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want the dirty job. I don't want to be a part of what's, what's taking place. You know, there's been a quote that I've used over the, the, the last probably year and a half that I, I found from A.W. Tozer, and he said this, and he said, what we have to remember is when it looks like things are out of control, behind the scene there is a God who hasn't surrendered his authority. Yet that is the one who we surrender to. So when I think of surrender and one of the greatest ways that we surrender, I, I remember kind of growing up in the church and in, in my teenage years when I, I was beginning to have you know, some real experiences with the Lord and be, beginning to you know, try to follow the Lord as much as I could and, and you know, surrendering my life and trying to know His will and understand it and in the process of that, I remember being in a, in a church service and there, something came over me that I, I, wanted to, I wanted to lift my hand in church as a sign of worship. But I thought about that and I thought, you know, I, I've watched people most of my life in church lifting their hands. And I said, it really looks cool. And, and honestly, you know, as a teenager thinking about this, it really looks spiritual. I mean, somebody that knows how to lift their hands well in church, they really look like that, they've got it going on with Jesus. And of course, you know, there are now, there are videos that have been made, humor videos about the way that people lift their hands, uh, you know, whether it's this cup or, you know, the crab or, you know, all these other things. And, and there's all these different, but you know, I, I remember coming to a point where I, I just wanted to express what I was feeling in my heart in a greater way to God. And just trying to make my own sense out of this relationship with God and, and by what I saw from, you know, leadership or examples above me. And I remember the first time in worship that, that I made the expression of my faith that I wanted to reach out to God. And there was something that happened that in my heart, it was very freeing. You know, I don't care how you express yourself to God, whether you use one hand uh, both hands are, 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 are just one hand in a pocket, one hand up, or however you want to worship. I, sometimes when I'm worshiping God, I, I don't lift a hand. Sometimes I, I, actually, I just pat my chest. And that, that's one of the ways that I, it's like an expression of who I am. And, and I want to say to you that when we come to this place of surrender, you don't have to lift your hands in worship, but there's something that happens as we surrender our lives to God, and, and that expression of surrender is lifting our hands. And I want to conclude with this, this prayer this morning that I want us all to make in our own way. God, I surrender my worries, my problems, fears, and doubts to you. Look at those four, th those four things. My worries, my problems, my fears, and my doubt. I think that just about covers it all. God, I surrender my worries, problems, fears, and doubts to you. Your powers are great. They are vast. Empower me. Guide me. Give me vision. Give me clarity. Open doors for me. All things come from the unseen to the seen. And strengthen my faith to trust the process. Would you stand with me? What I want to ask you to do as we close, I want to ask you to do two things. The first one I want you to do, I want you to read this yourself. Read that prayer.
Now I want to ask you as an extension of your faith, as a sign of surrender, I just want to ask you, because I'm going to read this prayer again before we pray, I want to ask you to close your eyes and just lift one hand. And as you lift a hand, that's an expression of your faith to God, saying, God, I fully surrender to you. God, I give you my life. God, I want you to be in charge of my destiny. God, I surrender. I give it all to you. God, I surrender my worries, my problems, my fears, and my doubts. I surrender them to you. For your powers are vast. And I ask you today to empower me. I ask you today to guide me. Give me the vision. Give me clarity. Open doors for me. All things come from the unseen to the seen. And God, I ask you to strengthen my faith to trust the process as I de deny myself, pick up my cross, and I follow you daily. Lord, let this be the prayer of our heart. Let our hand be the extension of our expression of weakness to a God who is strong. Lord, we humble ourselves before you so that you can lift us up. We thank you, God. In the awesome name of Jesus, we drop the fourth anchor today, the anchor of surrender. And we say as a body of people, of believers, God, we're yours. God, we're yours. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have an awesome day. Let's stay surrendered to him. God bless you.